I, I, I just want to, I, one bit of me feels I might be very, very naughty because yesterday we did, we did a thing with Reprieve and Ian Cobain on basically the outsourcing of interrogation, the privatisation of interrogation by the British government, but I won't, I won't go there. I, um, and, well, it was, it's basically, in the privatisation, the outsourcing, you could call it, outsourcing to other governments, but um, in the, can I take our I'm very willing systems? to defend that. Proposition. Um, that's another debate. That's another debate. Um, I'll take. I'll take a whole. I'll take sort of four or five questions. Yeah. There, there, there. I'll take all of them. There, there, there. Okay. If you could be very quick, so that's fast. Um, my my question is about the different attitudes of the security service and the secret intelligence service in declassifying records. Um, Daphne Park, who. So I died yesterday and once told me that she believed that when MI6 started giving people laptops, they didn't really have any use for fuzzy old bits of paper and they destroyed it. It never seemed particularly plausible and I hope for the sake of uh, Professor Jeffrey's book that this isn't the case. In fact, I mean, I understand there's a huge amount of back material. But why is MI6 so totally opposed to releasing a single document going back to, as far as 1909 and the security service comparatively open. Question about the investigative house tribunal where you just were. Most of the cases of course aren't heard by anybody other than the tribunal itself. Last figures I can remember were about a thousand referrals, and I think two or three are being found in favour of the public. Do you have an opinion as to why there's such a difference between the two figures? Very good question. Uh, no, there's a too large a subject, but uh, I would like you to elaborate a little bit on the danger that if our government, for example, if our government is too effective, uh, it will uh, alert five governments. The fact that we have a very effective... Uh, <laughs> I suppose the greatest example of this is uh, Bletchley Park and the war. Uh, we dared not. Um, sometimes we actually had to allow a battle to be lost or, or a convoy to be sunk in the Atlantic so as not to alert the Germans to the fact that our intelligence services were doing something what they were going to do. Yes. Okay. Do you have a view on as to why uh, the intelligence services worldwide uh, got in a situation with uh, weapons of mass destruction zone in Iraq. Yeah, that was half my question as well. But uh, where in you laid out very clearly the scheme of in your scheme, but where did, where does the the, the famous mm -hmm. so-called Dodgy Doss fit? Because there's an example of some intelligence that obviously wasn't very good, but was also Manipulated along the way before it was used to justify the war. I'm oh, oh, sorry, one there and then one there. I don't think that I'm so sorry. Do you agree, in the context of that last question, with <clears throat> the argument made by Robin Butler in a lecture here in Oxford a year or two ago, that uh, a good major factor was that the, insurance, the uh, intelligence community so spectacularly failed in respect to the invasion of Iraq, in Kuwait? that they were then seeing the pot as half full, or more than half full, <coughs> combined with severe political pressure on them to deliver the answer which the Bush government wanted. In a very complex world, uh, separate intelligence bodies, organisations, can only act as an intelligent system if they talk to each other. That is, share information. Share and share and share. Um, I understand from the introduction you are a coordinator. Um, so perhaps you would know. Do they share? 